4. I want to read in verse 13 while you're turning there. We'll pray and thank God for his goodness and his mercy. Amen. Amen. Father, we praise you tonight. We thank you for all your goodness. We thank you for all your mercy. We thank you for everything that you've given us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to bless us tonight. We ask you to bless the people tonight, Father God, and just fill us up. Give me utterance in the Holy Ghost that I, I minister a clear and precise word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week I said, you know, it's one thing to know about something, and it's another thing to know something. A lot of people know about something, but I found out in life not everybody knows about about that something that they know about. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I guess we could say it's like, well, forget it. I don't want to get in trouble. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says this. It says, uh, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to it is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe, and therefore speak. And that's what we were talking about. We were talking about a spirit of faith. And the spirit of faith is caught. You have to catch a spirit of faith. And really the title of these messages are Catch It, all right? And so it's important that we, to our faith, that we have a revelation. And this is what we were talking about last week. We have a revelation and understanding of the love of God that he has, the love that God has for us. We need to understand that. And a lot of people out there say, well, I know God loves me. And uh, that's good. But do we really know that God loves us? Do we know that we know beyond all understanding that God loves us? And once we get that re the, the, the revelation of the nature of God, we just sang that song, I've got the life of God in me. i got his nature. All right? So the nature of God is love. All right? The Bible tells us God loves us. The Bible tells us God is love. All right? And he wants to bless us. He's merciful. And we have to know him as a loving father. Uh, without the not, we, and I said this last week, just a little quick review. Without that basic knowledge, and that's really simple, basic Christianity 101, God loves me. And, and well, without that knowledge, we reduce Christianity to formulas. And there's nothing wrong with steps, you know, seven steps at a higher kind of prayer and faith and so forth. But we get into these formulas. If I do this, this is going to happen. If I do that, this is going to happen. And, and it becomes a formula. And a lot of preachers preach that, you know, if, if you give X amount of dollars, this is going to happen in your life. And that's not always necessarily the truth. So it becomes a formula. If I do this, this is going to happen. Well, I can tell you what you could expect. If you, if you tithe and you give offerings, you can expect God to bless you. Amen. Amen. That goes without saying because that's what the Word of God says. Amen. All right? Okay. And so, and, and so we have to understand that. And, and what happens is when we get into these formulas, it leaves out our personal communication with God. In other words, we're just doing it to do it. And we can't do that. Uh, and some happen, and you'll see people get hold of some formulas in Christianity without really ever completely surrendering themselves to God. Amen. Without ever completely surrendering themselves to the Word of God. And when that happens, the life of faith becomes an exercise. That really accomplishes nothing but maybe selfishness, self-centeredness, and greed. And that's what we want. And last week we said... We read, that's what we don't want. I thought I said that. Um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. And, and we read this list. We're going to continue it tonight, okay? About the love of God. So important, the love of God. Everybody say, the love of God is important. And we looked at this last week. It says, and we teach it, people say, Faith works by love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6 says, For in Christ there ne neither Jew circumcision nor un uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And I, and I hammered this kind of home last week. 
because we kind of talk about our faith walk and walking in love towards people and not having unforgiveness towards people. And that is certainly the truth. That's a lot what that verse means, but it also has another meaning. And I said that last week we talked about it. You know, uh, Jesus talks about it in Mark chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, about not forgiving people. And it all comes, you know, it all comes by our love walk, all right? But there's some more fundamental truth to this than we kind of like gloss over it, that we need to embrace so we can love and forgive others. And that fact is our faith will not work unless we understand the love that God has for us. Faith, what, what did it say? Works uh, faith works by love. <coughs> well, my faith works because I know God loves me. Therefore, I can love other people. I can walk in forgiveness again from other people. If that makes sense, but I can walk and somebody does me wrong, I can forgive them Amen. because of the love that God has for me. Yes. So my first faith works by His love that He has for me, Amen. which makes my faith work because I can walk in love towards other people who are not so lovely. Amen. Amen? Amen. And and so what happens? A lot of people have a problem with their love walk uh, with other people is because they don't understand that God. Loves them unconditionally. Amen. So therefore their faith doesn't work. I hope that made sense to you. Because it did to me. Alright. Listen, 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 simply says this. We love him. Why do we love God? We love him because he first loved us. That's it. We responded to God's love towards us. Any unconditional love you have in your heart from any, for anybody came from God. He's the initiator of love. But why? Because the Bible says he's love. We simply respond to the love of God. Amen. Uh, we're to enjoy his love and express his love to other people. But we respond to his love. You know, when you really walk in love, I look at the, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, on a little bit further, says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the first fruit of the Spirit. Because, the, and, and when a person first receives Jesus as their Savior, the very first thing, bar none, is they exhibit love. Because they've experienced this awesome transformation in their spirit. And they're just so full of joy. And that's the second fruit of the spirit. The first one is love. You know, it looks like they swallowed the canary, man. And they got all this joy in their heart. Because it's God. It's the love of God that comes into us and just overwhelms us and overtakes us, Amen. makes us emotional, makes us yeah. want to cry, laugh. Lord, and, and then the ne very next thing they get is peace. Amen. It's like they can have all the problems in the world happening. They receive Jesus. They sit there like, and they're happy, and they don't care about their problems anymore. Amen. Oh, just to stay that way. Amen. 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 <laughs> but we're just simply responding to the love of God. You know? God never. God didn't wait for us to get good. We've been waiting a long time. That happened. He didn't, he didn't wait for us to be perfect. The Bible says, "For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son to hang on a cross." He, he had this whole thing planned out from the beginning. The day Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God knew the plan, and He did that because that's His that's His love. For mankind that he would send Jesus into this earth it, it wasn't let me tell you something salvation is not based on you Amen. Amen. salvation is based on Jesus yes. Amen. salvation is based on God you you don't earn it and you don't deserve it Amen. and you can't work for it Amen. you can give all the money you want you can do all the good works you want it's not going to get you saved 
Amen. All right? It, it does, so God, getting back to that, doesn't wait for us to do something so he can love us. He loves us anyway. Yep. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And he's always extending and expressing his love towards us. You know, I said this yesterday. I don't know where we, where I was or something. But I said, God, you know, I love getting up in the morning and looking out, even if it's yeah. cloudy out. Yeah. Because yeah. I know beyond the clouds there's a canvas that God is painting yes. for the day. Yep. And when the clouds leave, it's, there's beautiful sky out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it changes. Yeah. He even changes it during the day for you, so you don't get bored. Amen. Because the sky is his palette. And he's ever changing. And he does that because he loves us. I was sitting outside in, in my uh, this morning outside by my house on my deck. And I was having a cup of coffee. And, and I was just listening to the birds chirp. Just listening to everything. Thinking, God. And it was like nice. You know what I mean? I'm not a bird watcher. You know, I just like, I'm just like I'm weird. But I was just sitting there, it was quiet, it was no, there wasn't a wind. And I hear the birds chirping away, and I looked up at the sky, and the sky, and I said, dear God, it's a little it's hot, and a little breeze blew by. And I'm thinking, God loves me that much to do those things for me. Amen. That's the love of God. And guess what? I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. You know? But he's always, he's always going for us. Yes, yes he is. Amen. Yes, Amen. Yes, he is. <laughs> you have your Bible, turn over to Ephesians, one chapter over. Ephesians chapter 3. And one thing that it will establish your heart in the love of God, and I don't know how many people have been coming on Thursday night listening to Daryl preach on prayer, and I know he's going through those prayers in Ephesians and, and so on, in Colossians. But one thing that will establish your heart in the love of God is praying the prayers that are in Ephesians. Yes. All right? And they speak about being rooted and grounded in love. Yes. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 19. Let's just read them, okay? It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the, to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through, the Spirit, through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, and there's that phrase, rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height to know the love of God. So now he wants us to know the width, the length, the depth, and the height of his love that he has for us. <clears throat> I remember years ago when we first got to verse 19, let me read it, it says, to know the love of God which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You want to be filled with the fullness yeah. of God. You've got to comprehend the love of God. And you comprehend the love of God by being rooted and grounded. Yeah. I remember, you know, I looked at that one part. Width, length, depth, height. And uh, I'll never forget, years ago we were up on a, on a boardwalk in Point Pleasant. In my, and we used to sing this song. It's got love like an ocean, yeah. you know. And an ocean's powerful. It's big. It can do a lot of damage. But, but yet, it, that's how big God's love is. Yeah. It's as big as the ocean. Bigger than the ocean. So when you think of the length and the depth and the width of the ocean, you need to think about the love of God. That he has for you. You know, he just doesn't will it down to like one person. It's for everybody. Amen. It's and, and there's so many people running around, Christians especially, but so many people in the world are just not happy. Things just aren't going right in their lives. They're always like a sour puss. When you have the love of God, 
you, inside of you, wall to wall. And this verse of scripture that Paul was speaking about here is just as much true today as when Paul wrote it because it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. And like I said, in order to be filled with the fullness of God, you need to know the love of God. Amen. And it goes on to say, it passes all understanding. That's what people can't, they go till. See, the love of God goes beyond your natural ability to comprehend it in your mind. You just can't comprehend it. You know, I tell people, when you start like thinking about how God created the heaven and the earth, you're out of faith. You know, when it says, in the beginning, God created. Well, number one, where was and when was the beginning? Now, when you try to start to figure that out, you're not in faith because you can't figure that out. You just have to believe, hey, man, there was a beginning, and whenever it was, he created it. What was there before the beginning? Was there God? <laughs> so, like, I don't even think about those things because my mind can't figure that out. Neither can yours. It goes beyond the mental ability to figure it out. Scientists and astronomers and all these people, they can try to figure it out. They can put all their little telescopes out there, keep looking deeper and deeper into space. They ain't never going to figure it out, man. Okay? Because it's beyond our mental capacity to figure it out. You figure it out when you get to heaven one day. I was just thinking about George. George figured it out. He knows all the answers. We don't. Okay. So the love of God goes beyond our ability of our natural mind. It just it doesn't make it there. That you, hey, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible, okay? It says, and, I, and I, I, I love this stuff, but it says here in verse 19, that you may really come to know Practically, through experience for yourselves, the love of Christ, which, <clears throat> which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. It's like I said, you might know something about something, but it doesn't mean you know anything. That you may be filled through all your being unto the fullness of God may have the richest measure of divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Wow, I like that, man. That's where, I, that's where I'm going. You know? So it's, it's a one thing to know about God's love in an abstract way. You know, we sing the songs, Jesus loved the little children. You know, this I know because the Bible tells me so. And you know what? A lot of people, that's the way they know the love of God. It's abstract. It's not experiential. All right? But but so it's a whole other thing to experience God's love for yourself. Amen. And you need to know and understand firsthand without any doubt, doubt that God loves me. And it begins in verse 17. Knowing God in his fullness begins with being, what did I say? Rooted and grounded. A lot of Christians aren't rooted and grounded. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Don't know what that means in this, but it sounds like good. <laughs> really, the foundation of our faith. See, this is why I said... But when we, when we looked in over in Galatians about faith, love, and working. See, because the foundation of our faith is an understanding of God's love for us. A foundation of our faith is understanding God's love for us and God's love for other people. Okay? See, and, and, be, and when love begins to work in your life when you get a revelation of his love for you. 
then you, no matter what comes at you. I was talking to someone today. They said, I believe God, you know, won't give me more than I can handle, but it sure feels like I can't handle anymore. I says, that's okay. I says, because you can handle it. I says, and what's going to happen is you're going to come through on the other side and everything's going to be good. Amen. Then you're going to move to that next level of faith. Amen. And the devil's going to come at you to try to knock you down. But you'll find out as you go along, it becomes easier. Every, you know, the beginning is tough. You're going to say, okay, I'm taking a stand on God's word. Everything comes at you. You just look up, it's like, it, it, it's 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 like when the uh, what's his name there Harrison Ford and in, in, in when he was the rock was rolling through the man was coming at him well, that's what it kind of like looks like you're like oh my God <laughs> let's run but then you stand and, and then it starts to get better and, and then for a few months everything's great then you decide I'm gonna I heard something in the word I'm gonna go one step further. Because that rock is coming. But you'll see you'll stand stronger. Hello? That's what the Bible talks about when it says glory to glory, man. Faith to faith, glory to glory. So love begins to work in our life when we get that revelation of his love for us. And then only in then can we, we have that love towards other people. When we understand it. Uh, love's a big work. Okay? Uh, again, we have to understand that God loves us. But love is a big word. We only have one word in the English language for love. The Greek has a minimum of four. There are more, but there's a minimum of four words in the Greek language for love. Agape, storge, eros, and phileo. Now, agape love is the God kind of love, which we're going to look at here in a minute. Storge love is a love that's really not mentioned in the Word of God much. I don't think it's mentioned at all, but that's a love that a mother has for her children. Okay, it's a special, different kind of love. And you have eros love, that's erotic love. That's what attracts people. Two things that attract a man and a woman together are eros love and phileo love. Okay, the thing that brings your friends is the phileo love. Let you do this for me, I'll do that for you. We become friends, and so on and so forth. And we get Philadelphia from that word. <clears throat> okay, the city of what? <laughs> okay, so, but then we have Eros love, and that's the attraction between a man and a woman. But over in Ephesians chapter 3, the word used for love is the word agape. And that's the God. We always say, that's the God kind of love. And everybody goes, yeah, that's how it is. Amen. But it means love and affection in the sense of benevolence, the unconditional love that is unique only to God. Amen. You know, I always tell people this. You know, people say, ah, I agape God. No, you didn't. When you got saved, you didn't agape God. You didn't know what agape, we wouldn't know agape from whatever. The reason you responded to God and you love God is because God did something for you. It's called phileo love. He agape you because he loved you in your sinful condition and how bad you were. But you could not agape God back. Impossible to agape God back. Because agape loves you in spite of yourself and there is nothing to spite about God. You responded to God's love. His agape unconditional benevolent love, you responded to that because you responded back in phileo love. Don't chat me down because I'm preaching. Right. And if you had to go to seminar, it cost you $150 an hour. Listen to and you're getting it for nothing. God's love, there's no strings attached to God's love. You know, he, he just loves you because he's God. You can't coerce him to love you. You can't beg him to love you. He loves you. Amen. When you think about that, wow, he loves me. It's not based on your character. It's not even based on your performance. That's where grace comes into the picture. You know, we talked about grace a few weeks back. That's where grace comes in. Grace isn't based on performance. Grace is God's love. Amen. 
You know? When we just sang that song, we got the life of God in me. That's God's nature. It's based on God's nature. Now, if you have the nature of God in you, my wife's getting nervous. She's probably going to throw the bottle. Anyway, we have his nature. That means we have the nature of love on the inside of us. And people say, oh, I don't know how I could do that. I don't know if I could love anybody. Well, <clears throat> Pastor, you just don't understand. No, you don't understand. The Bible tells me in the, in the book of Acts that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And guess what that love is called? Agape love. So the agape love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. For you to sit there and tell me you can't love somebody, you can't forgive somebody, you know what it tells me? You're a liar or you're not saved. Because according to the Word of God, you can. Amen. You can walk in forgiveness and yes. you can love yes. people. Hallelujah. Yes. All right. Now preach. Now shout me down. Now. <laughs> and and, and I, well, I don't understand why people have such a hard time understanding that God loves them just the way they are. And people do. You talk to me, you minister to people, they just have a hard time understanding that God loves them. And it's really on after we're born again that, and, and that we and, and spiritually connected that we can even begin to experience and understand in our hearts the miracle that has taken place of his unconditional love. The world cannot, there is no way an unsaved person could comprehend it. It's, it's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, and after we're saved, we struggle with the idea that God loves me no matter what I do. Because we do something, and the devil's right there to tell us, you know what, you really messed up, you really failed God. Yet we hear teaching on it all the time. How God loves us, and we shout it. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And, and we introduce unbelievers <laughs> to the love of God by telling them how much God loves them. He's not judging anything. He just loves them unconditionally. He gave his only begotten son for them. Or if someone comes to you, <coughs> excuse me, for something they did and, and they think God doesn't love them anymore, we say, don't worry, brother. God loves you. Don't we? We just say, God loves you. And, but and yet when it comes to our own personal life, ooh, I just lost everything. <laughs> I'll come back. Yeah, it's down there. Wow. There it is. When it comes to our own personal life, and our own complete faith and trust in God, we often stumble, stumble because of wrong thinking. God loves you, everybody. We go, God loves everybody but me. I'm not good enough. I'm not living right enough. I haven't prayed enough. I'm not worthy. And these thoughts are just a lie from the pit of hell. Just a lie from the pit of hell. And they're perpetrated by the devil to stop you from walking in love and faith toward God and helping other people. It all comes back to helping other people. If the devil can convince us that God doesn't love us, then it's easy for us to believe that God doesn't love enough to heal us, deliver us, prosper us. Therefore, we'll have no faith in him to do those things. We'll have no faith in him to perform our work. And before we know it, our confession starts to change. And guess what? Our confession doesn't even have to change. Just our mental attitude can change. And that is just as, that's even worse. Because now you don't say anything. The devil just had you thinking and thinking and thinking. You, tonight, have to do one thing. Till we come back next week. And that is to embrace God's unconditional love for you. Because it's easy to hide among church people. 
It's easy to rejoice when you're with others in church. But what happens when you're alone and trouble comes? Can you just, uh, I mean, you're in your house. When trouble comes. Is it, is it easy for you to get up and just do a little jig like, hey, yeah. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. Mike might do it. <laughs> but think about it. When you're alone, what do you really believe? What do you say? How do you pray? What, what results are you thinking about? <clears throat> Smith Wigglesworth, for those of you who know who he is, he used to get up in the morning, and he just used to do a little dance in, in the mirror <clears throat> to let the devil know he's still a child of God and believes. Amen. He would just start dancing. He's the kind of guy who go, if the spirit ain't moving, you get the spirit moving. Amen. That means to stir yourself up. Yeah, you know, with Chicana glory, that's a, they were stirring you up. A lot of you got stirred up. But it's a week later. You stirred down in a pot simmered a little bit. But you were stirred up. Some of you were doing things I never saw you do. Now, it wore off. Well, you need to get up and look in the mirror in the morning and say, start dancing and singing. All right. <laughs> Do we really know and believe that God loves us and wants to help us? And that all his promises are yea and amen? Because if we did, we'd sing every day. It didn't matter what's going on out there. And so in order to believe that, you have to get that revelation that I'm talking about. Amen. And you can begin right now by confessing how much God loves you. Amen. Say it two or three times a day. Just say it. Just say it. Write it in your car. God loves me. There's nothing I can do about it. Why don't you even curse at the kind next to you and say, God still loves me. And then ask him to forgive you. But you understand my point. You cannot make God love you. Stop loving you. You just can't make God stop loving you. There used to be a song, wasn't it? Can't stop loving you. But say it over and over. Thank God. Thank God that the love. Say, God, I thank you that the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. You might not feel like it. You may be like want to kill somebody. But thank God the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. I, I used to tell people, and I, I, I didn't come up with this, but I heard another preacher say it. He said, he used to tell people, Oh, you, go ahead, smoke cigarettes if you want. But some people really want to quit. So, how do you get a person to quit? He said, real simple. He said, every time you write, light up a cigarette, just say, I light this cigarette up to the glory of God. Because the Bible says, do everything to the glory of God, doesn't it? Amen. Well, smoke your cigarette to the glory of God. See how long it takes you to quit smoking. Because if you're really serious about quitting smoking, it won't take you too long to quit. Huh? Anything. Say, I eat this lasagna to the glory of God. <laughs> When you're eating your fifth piece of it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But I'll never forget when the minister said that. He goes, oh, man, I don't, God don't care if you smoke. Smoking ain't going to send you to hell. You'll go to heaven. You just might get there quicker. <laughs> so he used to tell, honest to God, he used to tell people that. They go, but I really want to quit smoking. I can't. I can't. It's got such an addiction on me. He said, well, every time you light up a cigarette, just say, I like this to the glory of God. He said, nine out of ten times they quit smoking if they really wanted to quit smoking. Because some people really don't want to quit smoking. They say they want to quit. They hear how bad it is for them. But they don't want to really quit. 
Because they would. They knew how bad it was for them. They'd quit. I smoked. Nobody smoked more than me. I used to smoke four or five packs a day. I was in the cigarette vending business. I didn't have to even like go out and pay ten. Wow, I don't understand how people pay nine dollars for a pack of cigarettes. You gotta be nuts. I mean, we used to pay like back then seventy-five cents a pack. Then we used to sell them for a buck and a half. But still, I just you know used to. I always had it. I didn't have a carton in my car. I had a case. I used to smoke cools. The worst. They're worse. Don't. They're as bad as camels. You know how I quit? My wanting to be serve God got stronger than me wanting to smoke. Amen. You think about that for a while, it'll sink in. I said my wanting to serve God became greater than my wanting to smoke. And when that happened, I quit. And I didn't need Nicoderm or any of his other Chantex or anything else. I just quit. And brother, that was my business. You walked into my office, you had to wait a couple minutes for the cloud to separate. And it wasn't the glory cloud, brother. It was the tobacco cloud. And it wasn't even bad. The guy I used to, who used to work with me, Charlie, man, he used to, he would smoke just as much as I did. If we'd be in that office, it'd be like, what you think, Charlie? <laughs> and my two brothers never smoked a day in their life. They'd come in and they'd go, whoa! They said, well, you're in the cigarette vending business. What are you complaining about? So, amen. amen. Don't believe the guy. I don't know how I, I did metal on that one, didn't I? Well, we're going to come to an end. Music ministry, come back up here. We'll pick this up. Don't believe the lie. We'll talk about that because it is a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. See, having faith in God doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be difficult. Think about the faith you have for other people. Think about the faith you have for the brakes in your car. And God didn't make them. Some guy, somewhere in some factory made him, and you didn't know if he was going to have, if he had a good night or not. So yeah, you'll come cruising down the road 60 miles an hour and cram your feet on those brakes. How many ever crammed your feet on their brakes and the master cylinder went? Hello. You don't have too much faith in them brakes anymore. You'd be putting your foot out the door, dragging it, pulling up on a handbrake. But think, we have faith. How many people have faith in that metal chair there? What guarantee do you have? You know, actually, that shouldn't even be standing because all it is is molecules. And you should sit in it and it should just go. But you have faith in that chair that it's going to hold you up, don't you? You have faith in your hot water heater that's going to heat your hot water when you take a shower. But yet we can't have faith in God who created us. Think about that this week. Amen? Amen.